Hi, and welcome to Chautauqua People. I'm Ira Cooperman. Our very special guest today is Rosin Milanov, the new music director and principal conductor of the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra. Welcome, Maestro. Thank welcome, you, Ira. Welcome. It's a pleasure being here. You're uh, originally from Bulgaria, right? Yes. And uh, you've had a very interesting musical career. Besides conducting major symphony orchestras around the world, you've also made your mark conducting operas and ballet. Um, I know you've studied conducting at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia and the Juilliard School in New York City, but where did you get your start? Where did you first starting music? First start, st first study music. Sorry. Music has always been a very important part of my life. My parents were not musicians, but uh, my grandmother deeply loved music and she was singing in a church choir in Bulgaria for pretty much all her uh, life. And uh, the way I started um, music was uh, kind of a very interesting coincidence because um, classical music was not something that my parents would listen at home. Hmm. And when I was four or five years old, they bought our first record player. And tons of little 45 rotation per minute right. singles or whatever you call them. Yeah, so and then there was only one single LP, which was Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto <laughs> in a performance by Sviatoslav Richter. Oh, great piano. So of course I went through all the singles and then finally I got to this big one and the moment I put it on, of course, each side was close to 30 minutes. Yeah. So I did not move until the whole music was over. And I was totally spellbound by the beauty of that music. Wow. And they said, well, maybe this, this child has, has some talent for classical music. So they took me to the music school. At the time, you could take your child to mm -hmm. a specialized place to get tested as to what kind of aptitude they would have, right. whether if it's math or whether if it's music right. or visual arts. So I went there and after all the tests they said you should, you should start your child playing the violin and... Uh, the violin? The violin, yeah. Not because the piano? Well, I had a choice but they said violin is better because okay. you'll be part of an orchestra, it's more social. If you're a pianist you're a loner all your life. True. You know, except a few opportunities that you have right. to be part of an orchestra, the rest of it is right. uh, either playing alone or accompanying somebody else. So I started playing the violin and uh, this was the beginning of um, my musical career and I never really considered doing anything else. Uh -huh. Then I started singing when I was eight years old in a choir that existed in Bulgaria that was sponsored by the, the communists at the time and uh, um, now looking back I see that they obviously use the children for uh, very strong propaganda, yeah. but I think there is nothing wrong about displaying children with talent. Sure. We traveled all over the world. And singing is great. It's, uh, I mean, the voice is a wonderful instrument. Yes, and I think that probably I got further experiencing the stage and experiencing what is it to be a performer as being part of that choir. I, and I sang until my voice changed and then uh, there was a big dramatic moment because I couldn't be part of that, mm. that choir and so I think most of it was just because I, I could not have my friends anymore and everybody else was continuing but I had to drop out because it's, that's the voice I got stuck with <laughs> 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 after it's changed but uh, then I picked up the oboe because a right. friend of mine said if you play the oboe it will sound exactly the same like the voice you had as a boy. Oh. Plus, you could go and play in an orchestra. Right. And you have the same social experience. So I always liked that aspect of doing things together mm. artistically. And, uh, and then later on, I enro enrolled in the conservatory, which is the highest, sort of the equivalent of a college degree here. Mm -hmm. And I got a double degree in both conducting and tobo. And then I arrived to the States. When did, you, when did you come to the United States? I came exactly the year after the Iron Curtain fell. So it was the summer of 1990. Right, right. As a matter of fact, in a couple of days, it would be exactly 25 years since I arrived in the United States. Oh, great. And in a place that's not far, too far from here in Pittsburgh. That's great. And you earned a master's degree in oboe yeah, performance? Yeah, I did a master's degree in oboe because originally the intent was I won a scholarship to to the conducting department right. of Duquesne University, but guess what? I arrived there and to my biggest surprise, 
it turned out that they didn't really offer a conducting degree. <laughs> so someone did not read the instructions yeah. of that scholarship and they said, what else can you do? I said, I could play the oboe. I said, all right, so how about you do a master's degree in oboe here? I said, it's fine. Mm. And then that same summer, I went to Tanglewood and I had an opportunity to be part of the conducting program there and this is how my conducting career started moving That's in great. the United States. Who were some of your uh, idols or your teachers oh, there at, at Tanglewood? There were many. The year that I was there, of course we had Seiji Ozawa who came. Uh -huh. That was the year after Bernstein died. Mm. And unfortunately my biggest dream would have been to meet him in person. Right. And um, so it was a very strange mood at Tanglewood yeah. because everybody was sensing that, that incredible loss. Sure. And uh, particularly for the conducting program that sure. he was such a strong presence right. there and shaped the career of so many conductors right. that are now among the best American conductors. But they must have had other conductors. No, they did have. I studied at that year with Simon Ratto. He was mm -hmm. still young and upcoming. He was the Birmingham. music director of Birmingham yeah. at the time. Yeah. As I mentioned, Seiji Uzawa, I think Leonard Slatkin was there for a master class. Uh, of course, we had Gustav Meyer, who was the principal teacher. Yeah. So we had our fair share of uh, sure. exposure to different oh, ways of conductors. But, um, they're all different, too. Yeah. But uh, my biggest influence, I must say, would be my teacher that I had at Curtis and Juilliard, Otto Werner Müller, ah. um, a German um, professor that uh, first immigrated to Canada, then came to the United States right. and taught for many years at Yale University and also Curtis and Juilliard. Oh, wow. and was well, we know Curtis and Juilliard are among the, the very best yeah. music conservatories in the world, not just the United States, but in the world. They really yeah. are. And he was a teacher. He would spend time with us studying scores and right. just going through not that much about moving your arms because right. we believe that if you know the music well if you know every single fact about the piece right. which of course is the notes the notation the context of the piece the historical background uh, the aesthetics behind the the, c the composer's ideas right. then you would find a way to conduct it so I never really had an experience like that in my life. Mm. You take a score and then you spend sometimes a whole month studying one piece. Right. And that's, that's a long period of time looking at every single thing it is. from many points of view. So I owe a lot to Maestro Mueller for right. showing me that the conducting is not really that much about the physical part of it, of what people see, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, about how you bring a piece of music, how about how you bring something so intricate and uh, and, in, and, in, and a product of an enormous uh, uh, inspiration and very hard work. Right. How do you revive it on stage so it looks like it's being created at the moment? And mm -hmm. how do you behave as the advocate for the composer? Because right. he has nobody else but you. Right. to defend the original idea. So and I was raised up with that incredible sure. respect to the composer. And no matter how often that piece, whether it's Beethoven's Fifth or Brahms' Fourth, no matter how often it's played, it, you want it to sound anew all over exactly. again. Exactly. Because right? it depends so much. Right. With depends on who are you collaborating with sure. and how is your audience listening to the piece yeah. during the performance. Sure. It's incredible how how you can inspire them. How you sense even with your back because I don't look at their faces but <laughs> you know at their every moment yeah, how feeling. effective yeah. an idea sure. is in your translation to the audience. Yeah. I didn't know Mueller but I did know Gustav Meyer at the Eastman School. He was there for a short time before yes. he went to Michigan. He was an interesting conductor, too. I, I, I remember Ormandy, I remember, uh, I didn't know Stokowski personally, but conductors tend to live a long time. It's supposed to be one of the, uh, the some longest. Some of them. <laughs> some, some of them definitely yeah. do. But anyway, we hope you have a, a long tenure. I hope so, too. My grandfather here. lived until, until he was 104, so I hopefully I inherited his genes. Is that typical for Bulgarians, that they live a long time? Yeah, they eat a lot of Bulgarian yogurt, so that's <laughs> <a> secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. You know, you, you've been invited to conduct orchestras in Europe, Asia, even Africa. Yeah. But what interests me the most is how you keep track of your busy schedule with ensembles for which you serve as music director. 
the Columbus, Ohio Symphony, you're the new music director yes. there, uh, the regional Princeton, New Jersey uh, Symphony, and the Spanish Orchestra that you have, the OSPA, in addition to the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra. How do you do it? I'm a very organized person, so my, my life, uh, even though on the outside it might seem impossibly busy, on the inside it's incredibly organized. Good. And the key is that you should never rank the orchestras that you work for. Right. Each one of them should feel that they're number one. Each one is so important. So when, right. when I communicate with the person, my point person in each one of the orchestras, First of all, I, I communicate within two hours of receiving a message or a phone call. And, and you really try to solve the problems as they present themselves. You never really allow that problems or, 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 or something that, that is happening in those organizations to, to pile up. Mm. And um, our work is, is based on, on, on weeks because this is how the orchestra's rehearsed, this right. is the, the, the pretty much a schedule of an orchestra would, would start on Tuesday and go depending on whether you work on the weekends right. to Saturday or Sunday. And normally you start a program, you start rehearsing a program at the beginning of the week and then you do a number of concerts. Most of the time they are repeated performances of the same program. Mm. And so when you, when you divide the, the year in 52 chunks, it's pretty easy actually to use your free day on Sunday or That's Monday good. to transport yourself several hundred or several thousand miles yes. away as long as you have prepared everything in advance right. uh, logistically but also musically. Right. No, it it's, it's can be difficult, that's for sure. My, uh, my daughter and son-in-law, both of whom are musicians, live in the Philadelphia area and I've often gone with them to Philadelphia Orchestra concerts in the last 10 years, and I believe I've seen you conduct this famous ensemble. Tell us a little bit about what it was like to be the associate conductor of the great Philadelphia Orchestra. Oh, uh, it's, it, it was something that w went beyond any of my dreams. You had over 200 performances, right? I had over, over 200 performances in the course of my 11 years of right. tenure with that incredible ensemble. First of all, it is one of the great orchestras in the world. Right. And what is great about it is it's just, it's, you get technically proficient orchestras pretty much everywhere nowadays. Sure. This is not really a hurdle that people could not right. pass. But what was great with Philadelphia is their incredible sound culture. That there is no moment of the piece that did not sound special. Mm. Whether it was their famous string section right. with their very singing, almost Slavic approach to, to producing and right. spinning phrases or to the great personalities in the woodwind section, such yeah. as Jeff Kaner and uh, Richard famous. Woodhams and, uh, and famous, people yeah. that have so much to say. And uh, even uh, you imagine a small solo for flute or a small solo for oboe, but when is in the hands of great artists. They make it so meaningful and so right. important and so revealing in a way uh, that you have never heard it before. The brass section, so mellow when they need to be mellow and so powerful when they need to be powerful. And it seemed like in the greatest orchestra, every musician knows exactly their role. They know when they have to be heard and they know when they have to blend in. And you don't have to rehearse this. They know it. Must make it much easier for a conductor. Exactly. Because they play with their ears. They play, they, they use the rehearsals mm -hmm. so they could hear the parts of their colleagues. They don't use the rehearsals so that they could hear their own voice. Right. And um, so those ears were, and the many conductors and soloists that I saw performing on that stage. And uh, so interact and the humility and the respect that the musicians had among, among e each other right. and uh, their dedication to follow the directions of the conductor because this is also very important. You go to yes. an orchestra and if you don't have a huge clout as a conductor or a right. great biography or um, right. an important position, 
most of the time they look at you oh and now it's they filled up the week another the schedule guy. Right. with another guy so right. we could work right. but not in Philadelphia I think no matter who conducted them they always try to to welcome that person as That's part great. of the process which which is something that I, I believe is That's very wonderful. rare one of the other things that Philadelphia has is an outdoor summer home yes. the Man Music Center mm -hmm. believe it or not my very first job in Philadelphia was to do public relations for the orchestra for the Man Music Center. Uh, was working for an advertising agency back in the 1970s. So I always loved it. You were the uh, the artistic director, weren't yes. you? You were really the person that chose the music for. Uh, and I think of the Man Music Center similar to the amphitheater Very at Chautauqua. So. Mm -hmm. Outdoor concerts yeah, and in size and in feel and right. um, also in types of programming and. Um, and it's pretty much the same like working with the Chautauqua Symphony because you didn't really have that much rehearsals to prepare your, mm -hmm. your concerts. In Philadelphia, almost everything was on one rehearsal <laughs> that same day and then in the evening would be the performance. Here we do a lot of performances on one, but we also have the luxury of having a second rehearsal for right. some of the events that we have at the amphitheater. Um, it, it's very similar because I learned how to program for summer audiences. Because summer audiences are not the same as... As the as Thursday as night, Saturday exactly. night. Exactly. Right, yeah. And sure. um, they view the summer concert experience as, as what we all think about the summer. As, as time when we have an opportunity to relax sure. a little bit, to, sure. uh, to make our life a little less stressful to gather with friends, to, to, to do all these beautiful things that, uh, that you could do outdoors as well. And music naturally could be a very big part of it. But it perhaps has to be a little bit on the lighter side. It has right. to be a little bit more on the surface rather than doing a, a big deep piece that would require an immense concentration and right. the benefit of playing in an enclosed sure. acoustical space. Something that's a little lighter, yeah. I uh, I know that you you conducted the uh, Chautauqua Symphony this season uh, on a Sunday, which is a first uh, matinee kind of performance. It was light, and you, you even let the uh, the audience uh, choose some of the pieces. Although yes. you ended up playing everything, <laughs> but that was that was wonderful. Um, and I just I wonder um, is there a possibility that we may get to the point at Chautauqua where we actually may repeat some of our performances, like we repeated Carmina Burana, which I know is a, mm -hmm. a special thing, but I have friends that keep asking me, why not repeat some of our concerts that you do, say, week two, week six, or week three, because many people at Chautauqua come only for one week True. now. True. Is that a possibility sometime it, in the future? I'm sure it, it, it certainly is, uh, is a topic that we could discuss, and you're absolutely right. I, I don't think that much has changed in the way we program our season because right. we automatically assume that people that would be there for the entire period of nine weeks but they're not. would not want to hear the same piece twice. Right. But I actually, on the contrary, I think that sometimes hearing the same piece twice so. within the same season would prove how important live music is because those two performances right. are not going to be the same at all. That's right. And, and, you know, we're told that you have to repeat things seven times before you're going to really remember them. But well, what about <laughs> music? It's yeah. the same thing. Why not? And, and again, most people come for a week, maybe two weeks, so separate the concerts by several weeks. Anyway, it's just, just one idea. But I, I like the idea that you are in, interested in innovation, doing some things that are different at Chautauqua. And I think that's what Chautauquans want. I really do. Um, you've, you've also collaborated, besides conducting Philadelphia and other great orchestras, you've also collaborated with some of the world's preeminent musicians and artists, people like Yo-Yo Ma, Yitzhak Perlman, uh, Joshua Bell, and others. Do you have any special moments that you recall from working with some of these really outstanding soloists and really special concerts that you performed? Oh, yeah, of course. I, I there are so many memories that come to to uh, to my mind thinking about that. But uh, one that was particularly touching for me was when we had to do Dvorak Cello Concerto with Yo-Yo Ma, mm. and obviously everything was one rehearsal, and there was no time right. that I could possibly accommodate all his ideas or all yeah. the, the traditional way the way he would would play the piece, 
and uh, I would never forget how the entire performance was very much fluid because he would incorporate my ideas mm -hmm. to his concept of the piece and uh, I would try to do the same with what he would present at the moment. So sure. we, we started the concert but we never really knew exactly how everything <laughs> was going to go. And uh, I, 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 th I thought that this experience was incredible because it's, it's something that classical musicians normally don't do. Right. This is reserved more for jazz men and, mm -hmm. and people that deal more with improvisation right. or that they have some idea but they don't know exactly yeah. how we're going to get to the end. It's a different and I kind thought of, yeah. that uh, a performance like this was so fresh and it was scary, of course, to, to sure. be at the moment, but that excitement somehow made it special and memorable that, at least for me, I would never, never forget that experience yeah. of, of such a collaboration. Yeah, it's a different kind of collaboration, that's for sure. So sometimes you get exactly yeah. the, the opposite <laughs> Uh, partner on stage, like right. someone that would insist on doing his way, or his way, way yeah. whether we could follow it or not, and yeah. then it becomes something that it's not really a right. partner play right. there. Yeah, it's not good. I understand that when you're away from the podium, uh, one of your favorite things to do is to cook. Are you a chef with specialties? Uh, why do you enjoy cooking? I don't know why I enjoy cooking. I, I, I love eating and uh, I love good food. I love things with good taste uh, in everything, not only... Mm -hmm. I like things that are beautiful. I like things that are thought of. I like um, things that are complex and not simple. And somehow I think my love for music and my love for and my attention to detail Right. got translated into uh, this almost instant satisfaction of making a meal huh. that would take an hour or two or half an hour depending on right. what you're cooking and sure. starting from a, from a point zero and then finishing the meal in, in an amount of time and having complete control over it you know in, including yeah. all the improvisations that you have to make if you don't have mm -hmm. the right ingredients or yeah. if, you, if you're not cooking at your own home so to me this is very similar to what I have to do on a daily basis yeah. on the stage it's just yeah. instead of doing it with sounds I do it with tastes it's interesting and, and it's also about making people happy and I think with music this is certainly very high on my sure list of goals and I think with food we, we experience the same type of sensation when mm -hmm. we gather with friends and the food is the sure. one that that creates the canvas on which right. a certain relationship uh, uh, unfolds and or at least unfolds much better when you yeah. have that. Sounds like a Mahler symphony to me. <laughs> it's, uh, pretty <laughs> it's pretty good. I think it's great. Do you have a, a personal philosophy that guides your actions when working with other artists, be they famous soloists or hardworking orchestra members? Do you have a personal philosophy? My personal philosophy is that it, it, it's, as far as music, I respect very much musicians in general, whether they're big name soloists or whether they're members of an orchestra or whether they're um, amateurs that want to be better. Right. I think that there is a, a certain similarity no matter where you go in the world and if you respect the talent of people if you respect the fact that they have sacrificed a lot in their life that their life is actually quite different than anybody else's life if you think about it they have this long history of connection with that art form that you can't even touch right. and um, and they do it because it gives them an enormous satisfaction and it gives them an opportunity to be part of a different world. Sure. And that they all, they create, we actually create for ourselves when we are on stage. And the audience is just witnessing that creation. Sure. They're not necessarily part of it. And that's my philosophy that if I respect my musicians, we will find a common language. That I'm not a dictator that would force them to do something that sure. uh, that uh, they do not want to do. Right. If I could find a way to making them express their feelings, right. 
and their talent the way they were expressing their talent when they were playing, let's say, as soloists, or is, is, is their sure. personal relation with the Home. instrument, then sure. I feel that I have achieved something that is important for me. So that's my philosophy. That's good. You, s you seem to have a flair for conducting. Uh, many members of the uh, Sh Chautauqua Symphony have commented to me that you constantly are seen smiling as you conduct. <laughs> <laughs> Are you aware that you're always smiling? Which no, they I'm like not aware. Very I'm not aware. That probably and they like it. They really I'm do like it. I'm very happy with <laughs> the way things are going. Sometimes I don't smile. I know that I don't. But, but most of the time you do, which most is really very do, nice. Yeah. What are your priorities for the Chautauqua Symphony? And, and how do you feel about collaborating with other areas of Chautauqua? You know, the arts, um, opera, dance, the visual arts, things like that. Yeah, I will answer first to the first part of the question. My priorities for the Chautauqua Symphony is to be the best that could be. I want the orchestra to be a fantastic opportunity for each one of the musicians to realize themselves at the highest possible level. Right. And then as a combined group of musicians to, to really make music at the highest possible level. Because I think Chautauqua deserves it. I think the level of sophistication of the audience, the right. information that they have about not only music, music is just one small part of our lives. Uh, they are open to ideas, they are open to abstract ideas, which music is part of, right. and uh, they appreciate quality because almost all of them have their local symphonies uh, right. that they support and then they attend on a regular basis and That's many right. of them are world-class level. Right. So my goal is to, to really raise the prestige of the orchestra to, uh, to, to, to a level where everybody is going to be very proud about being part of the Chautauqua Symphony and the Chautauquans are going to be proud of That's having great. an orchestra That's of that great. quality. Of course, there is al always my dream of, uh, of bringing people here with very interesting and original ideas, mm -hmm. people with to, to be part of the current state of the classical music, which I think it's also very important for a lot of people to, to realize because this is part of the mission of Chautauqua. Sure. We're here to be updated on what's happening in the world. And this also translates very well into classical music because right. We should not stop listening to pieces that sure. were sure. created 50 years ago. There should be something that, I agree. that we need to get familiar with from the music of our own time. I'm sorry to say this, but we have very little time left, so, so let me just ask you, how does it feel now to be here in your first season with the orchestra as the music director, as the leader of the orchestra? How did you feel about that on July 2nd when you stepped on the podium? It fantastic. I must say that in Chautauqua, unexpectedly, I did not expect that I would find my musical summer home mm. to a such a degree as I, I have found it now speaking on, on almost after eight weeks of, right. of being here in Chautauqua. I, I love the setup. I love the orchestra that I work with. I love the interaction with the audience. I love the importance of the music that is placed here, and I love all the different arts that coexist in Chautauqua and the great, great opportunities we have to great. do things in a uniquely Chautauquan way. Great. Well, thank you, Maestro, for being our guest. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ira. Wonderful. You did a wonderful job. And thank you. Thank you for watching uh, Chautauqua People. Our special guest today has been Ronson Milanov, the music director and principal conductor of the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra. Please continue to tune into our programs, which are repeated on the internet on YouTube. This is Ira Cooperman saying goodbye and best wishes. Mm -hmm.